Hello and welcome to the campaign strategy section of my Norskan guide. In this section of the guide, I'll go over the overall pros and cons of the Norskan campaign, my personal experience with it, the different factions and their unique aspects, and finally, any unique mechanics the faction has. There are also timestamps in the description, so feel free to navigate from there. Disclaimer. This guide is based on my personal experiences and opinions and is by no means the definitive way to play the game in Mortal Empires. If you have a different strategy or want to add something to mine, please leave a comment down below. One of the main things I noticed while playing as the Norskans was just how familiar they feel to the Warriors of Chaos, not only in theme but also in mechanics. They have a huge focus on sacking and raiding to fuel their economy and while it can create a huge amount of cash, I somehow still found myself struggling economically even later into the game. I think this was due to two things, the lack of recruitment capability once you get far enough into the south, and the lack of much other income outside of fighting. I found myself having to choose between wasting time marching back and forth, or wasting time and money on global recruitment, neither of which were good options. It would have been nice to see some bonuses to global recruitment, especially with such a hard focus on heading south as soon as you can. As for the income issue, while there are several buildings that get you gold, they are not nearly as effective as they are for other factions, and you'll find yourself in the red more often than not, meaning constant fighting is essential. This was made worse by the fact that settlement building outside of the Norskan North is next to pointless since you can only take coastal and capital settlements and can't really build enough in them to make a proper base camp, meaning the further you go south, the further you are away from safety and recruitment. The only safety that you can semi-reliably take with you is chaotic corruption, and even then it hardly does anything to slow down the enemy or allow you to be more sustainable, since they can just walk through it and kill you anyway, but hey, they have very slightly worse public order, so I guess it's even enough. On the bright side, when in the North you have one of the easiest starts in the game thanks to the tribe leader mechanic. It allowed me to take over the entire north in a matter of turns and gave me a huge head start in the campaign, which, when going against the Empire, is always very welcome. Something else that can give you a massive boost in power as well as fun are the monster hunts you can pick up via research. Each one gives you a series of quests that result in legendary items or units for the faction that almost always give you a huge power spike upon completion. Now I'll go over my experience with the campaign playing as Wolfric as voted for by you. Unusually for me, the early game actually went quite well. Aside from a bunch of PC stream crashes that I have thankfully sorted now, that reminds me, if you want to watch me stream the campaign playthroughs live, then be sure to subscribe to this channel, or if you prefer, you can follow me over on Twitch or on DLive. Anyway, I used the tribe leader mechanic to hunt down the Norsk and tribe leaders and took the entire top of the map by turn 20, which obviously gave me a nice head start and set me up nicely to head down into the pain that is Empire lands. Before taking on the Empire, however, I took on the smaller foe of Kislev, and by took on, I of course mean I repeatedly sacked and raised their settlements until there was nothing left. This was helped by Azhag and pre-patch Clan Mulder moving into every settlement I raised, meaning Kislev couldn't keep recolonizing until the end of time. Once they were wiped out, I turned my attention to the much bigger fish of the Empire in Bretonia. In reaction to an attack from Luan, I headed back through the north and came down on Corone with all of my armies, and managed to take the city just before turn 100. After this, I systematically headed south and sacked and raised my way through his lands until there was nothing left. It was about turn 140 when I had finished him off totally, and at this point, I made the single largest oopsie of the entire campaign. I managed to reach Max favour with the Crow, which spread a chaotic plague through the entire map, which would screw anyone over who wasn't a Chaos Worshipper. And you may be thinking, this is a good thing, and you're right. Unfortunately, I also got given a choice to either ally with the Chaos Warriors to get some bonuses, or fight against them for some bonuses. In the end, I decided I didn't want another faction to fight, so I allied with the Warriors of Chaos. What I didn't know is that in doing so, I declared war on literally every other faction in the entire game, except from the Warriors of Chaos. Hang on a minute. When the hell did we get war declared on us by them? Oh no. Oh, I see what's happened. I made a deal. Oh, oh, oh no. Oh, I regret that decision. Oh, I regret that decision deeply. So once I had expertly screwed myself over, I made one final effort to take as much Empire land as possible in my final streaming session, partly because I didn't want to go on, and partly because I wanted to get on with the guide. So I called my Chaos allies to clean up the mess in the northeast corner of the map, and set out making my way around so we could launch into the Empire together. I started with Mulder, since they were taking some of my lands in the north, and once they were pushed back and being surrounded by Chaos, I headed south into the Empire lands. I retook Kislev since the Empire had taken it back, and then headed west. I raised through to Middenland where Throg was waiting after a separate attack on the northern coastline, and then, once my forces were consolidated, I marched south to take Altdorf. It took a few turns of moving massive amounts of reinforcements into range, but I eventually took it for myself and called it a day. Now I'll go over the different factions, their starting locations, expansion options, and anything unique they bring to the table. First up we have the World Walkers, led by Wolfric the Wanderer. They start out at Icedrake Fjord, and taking them as your faction grants plus 15 melee attack for all mammoth units and minus 15% upkeep for marauders. 
Their climate preferences are frozen, wasteland, mountains, chaotic wasteland, temperate, temperate island, savanna and jungle are suitable, magical forest and desert are unpleasant, and ocean is uninhabitable. As for expansion options, you of course want to first take over the entire north using the tribe leader mechanic. After this, you really have a couple of options depending on what you fancy doing. You can head south into Kislev, the Empire and Bretonia, which are technically the main victory conditions as well as being lucrative, so not a bad choice at all there. You could head west to take on some Dark Elves, High Elves and even the Jungle Fiends if you make it south enough. Since you start in a corner and don't really have an obligation to ally with anyone, you can head in pretty much any direction you want, so I'd say either follow the victory conditions or just go after whoever has the deepest pockets. The other faction is Wintertooth, led by Throg. They start in Winter Pyre, and choosing them grants 15% physical resist and minus 20% upkeep for trolls and ice trolls. Other than that, they have the same climate preferences and expansion options as the World Walkers, so the same advice applies there. Now would be the time that I talk about the commandments, but strangely Norska doesn't have them, even though they can inhabit quite a few settlements and even a number of full provinces. If you ask me, this is a missed opportunity to add some more depth to the God of Legions mechanic, since you could set certain provinces to dedicate themselves to a deity in exchange for some buffs and some favour, but hey, that's just me. Maybe we'll see that in game 3. Now for their research tree. It's split into three trees and you have one for Marauder units, one for monsters, and one for pretty much everything else. The Marauder tree is just what you'd expect with unit buffs and pretty much nothing else. The monster tree also has a number of unit buffs, but also comes with techs that allow you to embark on a number of monster hunts, which I'll explain later. The final tree is by far the most interesting, especially once you get a couple of layers into it. You can research techs that make you better at fighting each group of factions in the game, as well as individual factions in these groups. So you can make it more profitable to fight versus the New World factions and then give yourself specific buffs for fighting against the High Elves and once you take the faction capitals you can get a further research in a single turn that will further improve your faction which can make the game into a fun checklist of taking on factions, getting all the projects done and then moving on to the next one. Personally, I think it's pretty neat. Now we come to the faction mechanics, starting with the ever unexciting Chaos Corruption. I'll be brief because I've said all this before, but basically you need it in your settlements for them to be happy, but once they get it, they receive no buff, which makes it the most useless corruption in the game. It also gives attrition to any non-chaos army that steps into your land, as well as destabilizing any enemy settlement that has high levels of corruption. It's automatically gets spread pretty much wherever you go, so most of the time you don't really need to think about it. Next we have the settlement occupancy mechanic, and yes, I know this isn't really a mechanic, but it's unique to them so I have to mention it somewhere. When playing as Norska, you can sell anywhere in the chaos wastes, but outside of them, you can only settle on coastal settlements and capital settlements. Now the capital settlements are fine since you can build a fair number of buildings in them and they are defensible and sometimes even profitable, but the coastal settlements I really don't get. While you can grow them to level 3, you don't have access to all the buildings in the faction in them so you can only recruit dog shit units and once you're far enough into the game that you're heading away from Norska, chances are you need units that aren't dog shit, making these settlements entirely pointless. Yes, they might be okay for bunkering down if you need a little rest, but if you've lost most of your army, they aren't going to do much to get it back for you. Personally, I didn't bother with the coastal settlements, but take all the capitals you can because those guys are great. Next up we have the tribe leader mechanic, and this one I know I've talked about a lot, but I'll give you the spark notes so you can see just how powerful it really is. Basically, you can battle a faction leader of the same race and provided you win, you can confederate that leader's entire faction, including all settlements and units. This means the early game consists of a whack-a-mole of tracking down faction leaders and attacking them to take all their lands. And if you want to find out what the name of the faction leader is, then just look for this name under the diplomacy menu. This is the best way to go in the early game and make standard expansion pretty much pointless. Our next mechanic is Allegiance to the Gods. Whenever you win a battle versus an enemy settlement, you are given the choice of four gods to raise it in honour of. Choosing the god will net you some favour for that specific god while lowering the favour with the other ones. And once you get enough, you'll start to get some unique bonuses. There are three tiers for each god and they are placed at 30, 60 and 100 favour each time. For the Serpent, tier 1 gets you minus 10% upkeep for all units, tier 2 adds plus 5 recruit rank for all units, and tier 3 adds a specialist chaos sorcerer called Kiha the Tormentor to the faction. For the Crow, tier 1 gets you 20% casualty replenishment, tier 2 adds a minus 4 to wound recovery time, and tier 3 causes a plague to be unleashed on the entire world that causes 100 chaotic corruption and attrition for all non-chaos armies. For the Hound, tier 1 gets you plus 10% weapon strength for all melee infantry, tier 2 gets you 100 XP per turn for all units, and tier 3 gets you a unique hell cannon unit, the Iceforged Legion, as an ROR. And just so you know, these unique units will be covered in the Army and Battle section and the Lord and Hero section respectively. Finally, for the Eagle, Tier 1 gets you plus 20% to research rate, Tier 2 adds 20 to the starting Winds of Magic for all armies, and Tier 3 adds Azric the Maze Keeper to your Lord Pool, who is basically a legendary Lord with no skills. Getting to the max tier of any of these gods will lock out the other three, so make sure you have all the bonuses you want before you advance to Tier 3, because you will not be able to change your standing once you get into Tier 3. They don't really tell you this, and I don't think it should happen, but it does, and it is very sad. 
Also worth noting is that when you get to a max tier, it seemed to pull that choice team that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so be sure to read up on that because if you ally with Chaos, you will go to war with the entire world. And if you're not prepared for it, it can really screw you over. Now the monstrous Arcanum is our final mechanic. And this is the monster hunts I mentioned earlier. Once you've completed a couple of research projects, you'll be able to embark on monster hunts, which are a series of missions ending in a battle versus said monster. The missions range from raiding certain areas to recruiting certain units, but they are bound to take you around a lot of the map. So be ready for lots and lots of forced marching. Once you get to the battles, be aware that they are actually pretty damn hard. So be sure you're ready for them with decent armies. If you don't want to sweat, swear and lose half your guys anyway. Complete these battles next you all sorts of great rewards like gold, XP, legendary items, and even some of the monsters as regiments of renown. So they are super worth doing, even if only in the background. That concludes this section of the guide on campaign strategy. The next section will cover the unit roster and how I believe each unit is best used, so stay tuned for that. Don't forget to vote on the poll for the next race you want me to make a guide for, which is linked in the description. If you want to check out the other parts to this or any other guide, then there's a link in the card and the description for a playlist to the series. If you enjoyed this video at any point, then please do consider leaving it a like as it really does help out a lot. And if you want to see any more videos of this type, then maybe click that subscribe button so you stay up to date. After all, this is free. For now though, I was Colonel Damdus, and I'll see you next turn. <laughs>